Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Gulf Coast. And if you're here in the main house, being in the lobby, you're straggling in. Welcome family online. So thrilled to have you with us this evening. If you're able, would you stand to your feet? We're going to open in a word of prayer. We're believing God for great things tonight. How many came here expecting absolutely nothing? Because if you did, you'll get it. But if you came expecting something, God knows exactly what we need. Amen. And he will give us exactly what we need to become exactly what he's called us to be. That's the hope we have in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to be in your presence. We pray, Lord, that regardless of the day, that in this moment, Lord, you'd help us to settle ourselves, that our spiritual ears might be tuned, Lord, to your voice. You're giving us a chance to worship you collectively, Lord. Your promises that you inhabit the praise of your people. Your promises, Lord, that you're right here in the middle of everything that we're doing. So God, I pray that you'd give us that kind of awareness tonight. And Lord, for the teaching of your word, begin to prepare the soil of our lives even now, Lord, so that when your word comes forth through scripture, Lord, that it has a good place to land. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, in these moments, Lord, to draw closer to you than ever before. And let this be the prayer of our lives at last. And all God's people said, amen. Let's worship. stand against your mind you've always been with us every battle you've already won we've already won put your hands together sing there is no weapon there is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you
all over this house, God. We bless your name, Father. We praise you for being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, how we love you. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, for me.
cry tonight. Lord Jesus, we just want you to fill us up overflowing so that we may press on and pass it on to others. Lord, we want nothing but to be your servants. We love you. We praise you. Give him a clap of praise this evening. He is worthy. Amen. Oh God, we are so thankful for you. Before you're dismissed and before you have a seat, turn to your neighbor and say, you're changed. And as our kids and students for youth are dismissed, I will share a few announcements with you. Praise the Lord. This Saturday at 11 a.m., this Saturday at 11 a.m. is Stand Your Ground Veterans Group. And so uh, Denny will meet you at 11 a.m. at the Olive Garden in Port Charlotte. Do not miss this time of connection. And if you know of a neighbor, a friend, a veteran, encourage them to be a part. We do have cards at the back um, at the sign-in table that you can take with you. And if you see a veteran, you can always invite them to come and share in these times of fellowship together. Then our young adults, ages 18 through 30, they are meeting on Saturday, April the 20th, here at 7 p.m. in the lobby with Pastor Nick. It's going to be a time of great discussion with their Bible study. And, of course, they have food. They just have to, right? And uh, a wonderful time of connection with friends. And so they're going to continue in their Bible study together. Do not miss this time, young adults. And then uh, our Mother's Day and Father's Day blessings. So during the month of April, we always take out a little time to say, if you want to be a part of blessing some of our moms and dads that are at our preschool, Gulf Coast Christian Academy, we don't say Gulf Coast Christian Academy for no reason. We want to show them the love of Christ. It is a Christian academy. They get the word of God. These little tykes are coming home and telling their moms and dads about Jesus. And it is such a blessing. However, some of them may only have a mom. They may only have a dad. And they do need to be encouraged. So that's why we're here. We want to encourage them. On Mother's Day, we give the moms a little um, bag, a goodie bag with some treats. And we give the dads the same thing on Father's Day. So if that is something that God lays on your heart you would like to be a part of, our women's ministry puts that all together. Just mark on your offering envelope, GCCA. Or if you're giving online, again, there's a special memo, and you can place it and say, GCCA blessing, and we will make sure that the proper finances get to the right department. Amen? Amen. If you pre came prepared to give in tithes and offerings this evening, uh, we have drop boxes at the back and in the lobby as well. Praise God. Glad you're here, church. Enjoy the word. Thank you, Krista. Wow. This is a big week. Have you, Have you heard? Like, like this, is, this is a big week. There has not been this much excitement about a wedding since Charles and Diana. I mean, it's like it's that big. I mean, it's, it's, it's big. And if you don't know who's getting married, well, it's, you just, you'll have to wait. Our very own uh, Randy and Jaden are getting married this week. Very excited for you guys. Very, very excited. Won't say too much. I get too emotional. Um, I just, uh, ever since Randy changed his hairstyle, I just can't contain myself. It's been, uh, it's been amazing. No. Uh, but um, we sure love you, Randy. Sure love you. Jaden's over with the students right now. But just, would you be in prayer for this amazing couple? And uh, God's got big stuff in store for them. They both have the call of God on their lives. And uh, we know that uh, the best is yet to come. And uh, they're serving faithfully in their jobs and in their work positions here at Gulf Coast. And 
those things are going to be increasing. You know, once, once they say the I do's, um, it will become the I wills, and uh, we're going to crack the whip and uh, use them for the kingdom, but uh, we sure love you guys. Be in prayer for them, and um, it's a big deal, and so uh, uh, Randy's actually sitting next to his uncle, Dr. Seth Postel. And we're so thrilled and honored to have you uh, here tonight. Uh, um, I know you're not feeling too well, but we're going we're gonna to drag you back here. I, I want you to hear from, from this man. He's an extraordinary teacher. Um, he, he is, he's one of the finest theological teachers you, you, will, you will hear. Extraordinary. I uh, just actually go on, go on YouTube, just look up, you know, Seth Postel, Dr. Seth, and, and he's got extraordinary stuff. He is uh, he's living in Israel, and um, he's a lecturer, professor. At, I think it's Israel, Israeli uh, College of the Bible, right? Israel Bible College. And uh, tell you what, it's really great to have you here, man. And um, and I'm glad you're here to help Phil uh, with uh, April because uh, uh, this is a big week. <laughs> it's a big emotional week. I'm also excited that uh, uh, Jade and Randy are getting married because that meant uh, that my daughter and my son-in-law, Cassidy and Jordan, are in the house tonight. So uh, they... Uh, they scraped the ice off the airplane, and they flew down from Minnesota, but they are here, and they happen to bring uh, their little man, Kieran, who is just, wow. I love my grandboys, and uh, um, I'm excited uh, that um, uh, Cassie and Jordan, they, they decided they're going to head back, and they're going to leave Kieran with us for a few more months, and so we're just going to just love on that guy. So. so glad they left the dog in Minnesota, so praise the Lord. Oh, I'm serious. Uh, you know, we're on this journey together. It's ordinary people, extraordinary purpose. Week one, we kind of established this thing, even though we don't want to think that we're ordinary. We're, we're like, like we're ordinary people, ordinary issues, ordinary problems, ordinary sin challenges, ordinary flesh. There's no superhumans. There's no super Christians. There, there's nothing like that. We, we're all ordinary people. And what's amazing is God loves you, loves me. He takes the ordinary and he calls us to an extraordinary purpose. At Gulf Coast, it's, we have this. It's, it's our tag. Love God, love people, make disciples. The Great Commission, the Great Commandment, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's huge. It's massive. It's extraordinary. And God's design to reach the world, and never forget this, is the local church. He established a church, and he sends us out. He calls us. This is what he does. And he uses ordinary people. We, we looked at the aspect of Stephen, ordinary guy. He's a deacon, first martyr of the church. The apostles stay in Jerusalem. The rest of the disciples, they are scattered. We dissected what that word scattered meant. It's not scattered as in running for their lives. The word scattered there means as though a sower scatters seed. It's with intentionality. They were sent. Philip is sent. Turns upside down Samaria. It's extraordinary what begins to take place. God is doing in ordinary people that which is extraordinary. It's the same God. It's the same call. It's the same opportunity. We're the same humans. There's not another breed of human out there, regardless of what you think of your spouse or your kids, all right? They've got to be from a different planet. God's call is for you. It's for me. So last week... God has the audacity to call Paul, Saul. Saul has a hand in Stephen's death. Saul is a guy that is sending people as far as 300 kilometers, about 250 miles away, to imprison them, the people of the way, the people of the church. This is, if you're a Christian, this is public enemy number one. This is a guy that you don't want to be around. And the Lord has the audacity to say, I am calling Saul. He's going to be my servant. I'm going to use him. This is what I'm going to do. And so this is where we break in tonight. I want to take a closer look at this call on Saul and how it correlates relates to you and me. And I want you to keep this in your minds that we're ordinary people called for an extraordinary purpose. So if you have your copy of the scriptures tonight, would you take them, please? Turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 10 to begin with. And if you're a note taker, 
We kind of finished last week with this. When you begin to step out in God's direction, God has a way of preparing others to strengthen you along the journey. God will do that. When you and I say, I just don't know how I can do this, how am I going to make it happen, the, the Lord knows exactly what you need to accomplish, what he's called you to do. And if what is required is someone else along the journey, the Lord's going to bring that person in. And they may be a helpmate. They may be just a friend. They may be an encourager. It, it may be a random text, a message, a thought, a word of encouragement, whatever. God's got that covered, okay? So, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias replies. Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas, and when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. <clears throat> I, I love this. Th this is God. He's able to give direction and receive prayer all at the same time. It's, it's wonderful. This is the omnipotence of God on full display. I'm giving you direction. Oh, by the way, the guy that you're going to meet, the guy that you've heard about, the bad guy, he is actually praying to me right now. And I'm going to break in here with just a little bit of an observation it's not very theologically profound. I just think it's theologically fun. If we get that scripture back up real quick, I'm just going to take a quick look at that. Um, because the Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. Now, this is not Judas, the 30 pieces of silver Judas, the betrayer of Jesus Judas. This is another guy who happens to be named Judas. Now, it's amazing right now that within Christianity, nobody names their kid Judas. In fact, I don't know if you can find anyone in the Americas named Judas. It's like no one names their kid Hitler, okay? Like, it's just like you don't, you don't have that name. And I, I, so there is a namesake that, that you and I, when we hear a name, there's an automatic connotation. Ooh. Like if a guy walks up to you and you say, hey, how are you doing? My name's J.D. What's your name? My name's Judas. Oh, man. I don't want to hang out with this guy. I know it's only a name. But it's amazing to me that in God's awesome sovereignty, of all the homes and all the places in Damascus where there could be a Christian, it just so happens that the guy's name is Judas. And I think what that does may be better for our audience than the original audience is this. Sometimes we allow things, namesake, heritage, identity issues, challenges, problems from the past, whatever, to kind of haunt us in our devotion or our desire to move in God's direction or to step out in faith. And I think it's just amazing that Saul, public enemy number one, goes to Judas's house and the street is called Straight Street. God is still in the business of making crooked lives straight. Whatever your story is, whatever the problem is, whatever the issue is, whatever the challenge is, when we allow God to get a hold of it, God doesn't need any more help. We just surrender that to the Lord and we watch God do what only God can do. And, and that little aside may be for one person here tonight or maybe one person watching online. You may feel like you've got a Judas complex or you've got a Saul complex or whatever. God can straighten out anything that needs to be done in your life for his purpose. I just think that's kind of cool. You know, Saul, Judas' house, Straight Street. This is awesome. So, now, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. So Ananias... There's a little bit of a, hmm, I don't want to go because I've heard stories about this guy. The Lord says, you need to go because I need to reveal to him something. I need to reveal to him that he's going to have to suffer for my namesake. And so Ananias has to step up 
put on his big boy Christian pants and do something that's difficult. The thing that was difficult for Ananias was that he had to go and speak to someone that could potentially be a harm to him. In this reading, in this period, there were, and we see this in lots of our countries around the world where we're sponsoring and we're supporting, we're helping missionaries, we hear the stories, there are people that fake conversion to get an inside track <clears throat> to expose other Christians for arrest. We've heard this from our friends in the Middle East. We've heard this from our friends in Asia. This is what Ananias potentially was thinking now. Maybe this guy Saul is faking it. So he's going to cause other Christians to show up. Then he's going to be like, surprise, I'm really not a Christian. We're just here to imprison you. <clears throat> but the Lord is speaking to him. So he goes. Does God still call us to do things that scare us? We all said yes. Then what is our problem? Because when God calls us to do something that scares us, makes us nervous, how many have been known to say no on a few occasions? Lord, I know you're calling me, but <laughs> the answer is uh, no. I would like to, Lord, go out and do something tonight, speak tonight, serve tonight, reach out tonight, but my wife made lasagna. I just don't think I'm able. You know, I would reach out to people. I really, really would, but I, I just don't like them. I got a problem. I got a people phobia. I got, we. God calls us to accomplish His work. His work requires this. Again, for notes. Ordinary to extraordinary will require on your part bravery. Bravery. God will give you power. He won't give you bravery. That's your decision. That is your decision. God will call you. He might even make a way for you. But you've got to have the guts to say yes. You are the one that controls the excuse meter in your life. I'm the one that controls the excuse meter in my life. I can be in an Ananias moment. Here, there's an opportunity. And I just can't say, oh, God, make me brave, make me brave, make me brave, make me brave. No. God will give you the call. They're given an extraordinary opportunity, but you and I, we have to step up. So, Ananias, he's having a conversation. But Lord, verse 13, Acts 9, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. <laughs> but the Lord said, Go. That's his answer. Go. Not a big reasoned response. Not a statement. Go. Go. And then he gives us go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to make my message to the Gentiles and kings, as well as to the people of Israel. So go. Just do it. I need you to do this because I am going to use Saul. Why didn't God, like, he kicked Saul off the donkey, right? When Saul said, small L, Lord, 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 who is it? And then capital Lord, capital L, Lord, responds, it's me, Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. Like, there's already been open conversation here. Why, why did the Lord need Ananias now to go to Saul? Why not just continue the conversation? Why? 
What's that? Okay, he's a messenger. But why use Ananias? Why not just continue on with the conversation you started, you know, on the road? What's that? Others are involved. What does that mean? Okay, what they need to do. What, why are others involved? Oh, there you go. There you go. You just, you just want biblical. <laughs> because it's God's design. It's God's design that you and me, we would be involved in reaching people that have the ability to reach people. So Ananias, you go. Because honestly, there have been many, many moments where I thought, you know, Lord, you could send someone way smarter, way more equipped. Do you really want me to do that? Do you really, really think? God uses people. God uses people. Why else do you think the Lord chose Ananias to go to Saul? Well, faith comes by hearing, okay. But, but, but why? Well, because he was brave, okay, maybe, maybe. Well, I think in the beginning, he's, well, he's arguing with the Lord. I don't know how brave that is. You know, like, I don't want to. I don't want to. <clears throat> I think that maybe, of course, you know, Ananias is, you know, when you're arguing with God, sometimes he wins. Why? Why else? So God can see what we think is impossible. Okay. I, I, think, I think we're getting somewhere. God uses Ananias to establish something before the people of the way that it's legitimate with Saul. It's legitimate. Ananias had some credibility with, with, the, with the Christians. And so what he's going to do, he is going to declare something to the other believers. Saul, Saul's conversion is legitimate. And then there's another huge reason that no one's thought of yet. Well, yes, so, so that's, that's to come. Okay. Faith factor, come to vision. Yeah. I think, I think everything's really good. We're, we're, we're skating around this, this amazing thing, and we've all forgotten Saul. He's blind. Not only is he blind, nobody likes him. Nobody. Did the Pharisees want to be with them? No. Especially, they begin to hear murmurings about this conversion thing. No one, no one's going to want to be around Saul. All of his old friends, his old cronies, he's toxic. All the Christians, he's toxic. Everybody needs to be touched by someone. and loved for Jesus. Everybody does. The meanest person you know, the most wayward person you know, the person that drives you insane, they need to know the love of Jesus, and we cannot accomplish that from distance. It's impossible. We have to get up into someone's business you know, it's been said, you know, you, you'll never resurrect the dead if you're afraid to touch a corpse. Okay? Well, we're not going to lead someone to Jesus, you know, you know, from 50 yards. Hey! God loves you. But stay away. That's why the church got into so much trouble when the whole COVID thing. It was just like, all the separation stuff, and I mean, that, that lasted here at Gulf Coast for like a month, and we're like, we're not going to do this anymore. This is just goofy. We're just going to love people. We're just going to love people. 
that there's something about distance. Saul needed to be touched. So watch this. Verse 14. He is authorized by leading priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name, but the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument. Take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for me. Ananias, you've got to go. This is my reason to send you. So Ananias is understanding something. I have to have a confrontation meeting. I've got to go. He doesn't know what he's going to run into. He doesn't know what's going to take place. He just knows that he's going. He's keeping this in his mind, though, that he is going to be a part of an instrument where this guy, Saul, it's going to be revealed to him how much he's going to suffer. And if I'm in a nice, I'm thinking, man, this is really going to tick Saul off. If we desire to be used by God in an extraordinary way, we need to embrace the whole idea for the potential of suffering. And if you're looking for a brand of Christianity that is free of suffering, I'm sorry, friends, to tell you this, but that does not exist within a biblical context. It does not. It, it, it might exist on TV at 11 o'clock at night. In a biblical context, it does not exist. So here we have this sobering call on Ananias. You go and you speak to Saul. I've got to reveal to Saul some difficult things. So verse 17 says, So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and says, Brother. Isn't that cool? Brother. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Brother. You're one of us. It's okay. It's going to be all right. You can't see me. Here's Saul. He gets word that this guy who's kind of a leader in the church is coming over, and, and, and you know, I'm totally defenseless, and what's going to happen? Hands get laid on him, and the hands are loving hands. The hands are caring hands. The voice that has spoken to him wasn't, hey, you jerk. I'm surprised that God called someone like you. Brother, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. That's awesome. Paul, Paul wasn't probably converted on the road this is probably his conversion experience. This is probably this beautiful moment where it was Ananias' hands, but Saul probably felt the hands of the Lord. There are people in our lives every single day that are desperately in need of feeling the hands of Jesus or hearing the voice of the Lord. And friends, that's extraordinary. That, that's, ex, that's extraordinary. You know, we're in, just uh, last week, I'm in Fort Lauderdale. And I'm driving down the road with my wife. And um, this young guy, he's holding this cardboard piece of paper. And he had written on it, I'm not a bad guy. I just need help. So he's standing in the middle of traffic. I rolled down the windows and I said, buddy, come here. And you know, I got, whatever, 30 seconds before my light turns green. And I call him over and I said, hey, man, what's your name? He gives me his name. I said, I just want you to know something. God loves you, man. God loves you. He's, he's got a plan for your life. I gave him some money. Yeah, I gave him money. We might drink it, Pastor. Well, maybe he needs a drink, okay? All right, we just need to deal with that. Maybe if you have had his day, maybe you just need a drink. Everybody's passing this guy. And I, I, wonder, I wonder what happened in his life where he thought, you know what, I've seen these other cardboard pieces of paper and I've got to write something on there, need help or I'm hungry or whatever. Whatever happened where he had... 
the thought, I just need to let people know I'm not a bad guy. I just need help. I'm so thankful for Ananias in my life that reached into my life and touched me when maybe I wasn't that likable. Well, pastor, you were born in a pastor's home and you're a Christian guy. You're the... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the, the overarching theme of my life. However, there are several seasons that I don't talk about where I was not a very nice human. I'll just leave it at that. And a youth pastor touched me, spoke into my life. Had a coach touch me, spoke into my life. Ananias touches Saul, calls him brother, speaks into his life. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to appreciate this about the call of God on our lives, especially when we're considering the extraordinary. All of it is impossible with the, without the indwelt presence of the Holy Spirit. It's just, it's just, if you think you can flesh it out, you can't. You can't. That's why it's the promise. It's an extraordinary promise for an extraordinary purpose, an extraordinary calling, but this is what God has for us. And it's so important, desperately important for you and I to engage in that and to embrace that, to realize that even though, you know, we're, we're 2,000 years separated from this story, we're several thousand miles separated from it geographically, and we're in Northport, Florida, okay? But we're in a moment in time where God is calling you and me to be keenly aware that there are other people that are out there. There are several Pauls and Paulines that are still out there that have yet to be touched. And maybe the Lord's call on their lives is what, you know, the Lord spoke and revealed that I'm going to use him or use her to speak to kings, to Gentiles, to Jews, maybe to be used to do something in ways like you and I, we've never done before. But we have to be willing to, even as an ordinary person, to embrace something that's extraordinary so that we don't play church or we don't placate moments within our lives and say, well, you know, I just, you know I'm just going to try to do my time. And so many people are upset today because, you know, the eclipse came and Jesus didn't. It's like we live in a culture of Christianity where we're just looking for the great escape instead of the great commandment. Because ultimately we're going to stand before the Lord one day and he's going to say, what did you do with the love I gave you? Well, you know, I hid it in my heart because I know that I'm your favorite. We have an extraordinary calling, church. So Ananias lays his hands on him, calls him brother. It's an act of love. It's an act of compassion. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's extraordinary. This ordinary Saul is about to come the extraordinary Paul. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and even his name change is, is, is wonderful. Because you know, his Jewish name is Saul, his, his, his Roman name is, is Paul, and it's common in this era, in this time, that you would carry two names. And, and sometimes you would use those names to your advantage. If you're doing business, sometimes people, because of attitudes, hey, you, you throw out your Roman name. Other times you throw out your Jewish name. But, but from this moment on, he, he goes by, by Paul. Even when he is surrounded and he's, he's talking to Jews. He's, he referred to himself as Paul. He would tell them, you know, how he grew up and all the, all the right things of privilege that he earned and he participated in all the schools of instruction. But he does it because this is the guy that says, I will become all things to all men that I might win some. Isn't that amazing? And then for him, you know, if, if I can reach more people by going with Paul, then I'm going to go with Paul. They're like, this is what I'm going to do. And it became so much less about him and so much more about Christ. And because of that, the extraordinary just blossoms. It's amazing. When we look through the New Testament and we see all of the writings and what he did and what he accomplished, with an ailment, with physical challenges within his life and probably emotional ones that were 
you know, only made more complicated because of his physical ones. And they're continually surrendered to the Lord. Surrendered to the Lord. This is just an ordinary guy with an extraordinary call, but he embraces it all. And that's what is before you and me. Today, this is what's before you and me. This extraordinary call for ordinary people. But we may be required to do things that are scary, that may involve suffering, that may take us out of our area of comfort. It may seem risky. But it's for the Lord. And Jesus is the keeper of the books. I had a lady that, that, that worked for my wife and I for, for years. Her name was Faye, and Faye was, she was so awesome. And every time something would go crazy or something would go wild, she would say, Jesus keeps the books, Pastor. It's okay, Jesus keeps the books. And we, we had a big rehab ministry, and, and Faye was the director of re- rehab ministry, and she was just, She's just an amazing woman. Great, great big lady. Bigger love. But every time something would go wrong and I would get stressed, we'd go, oh, it's okay. It's okay, Pastor. Jesus keeps the books. Well, he does. He does. He's aware of everything going on in your life, everything aware of everything going on in my life, your life, our opportunities, our potential, all of these things. And his design is extraordinary. We are God's masterpiece created for the good things that he planned before the worlds began. Like that's that's amazing. To me, it's amazing. The the idea that the Lord had a plan and a strategy for you before the world was created, like that's awesome. To me, it seems a little bit extraordinary. And this is the call that's on your life. You know, all the kids that are always up here on Wednesday nights, we got just a whack of kids. They're all over the place. If, if I brought one of those little kids up here and I sit them on the stage and they're seven years old, and I said, I want you to just take some time to speak life into this little girl. And if someone stood up and said, you know what? You're ordinary, and I think you'll be just fine. What would we do to that person? Tar and feather them, beat them up, throw them out of the church, you know, kick them, you know, whatever, pour hot coffee on them and something, like with love, yeah. <laughs> all in love. But no, what would we do to this little one? You're amazing. The potential that God has given you is extraordinary. Yeah, but people make fun of me. Oh, well, those people don't know what they're talking about. Boy, we would speak life, we would speak life into this child. And then we get older and we adopt the worst attitudes. Well, you know, I like God to use me, but I just, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm a little busy. I don't know. I just, you know what? I'm going to miss my opportunity. I took a couple swings at the ball when I was younger, and I missed. I don't know if God's got anything for me now. What a bunch of junk. I don't care how old you are to the, tonight. The, the call of God on your life is an extraordinary one. And if you have any other thought, that thought is of the enemy. Satan accuses the brethren and the sister. I don't know if that's a word, but we'll use it tonight. I got a professor in the second row. This is embarrassing. We'll compare doctorates after the service. I looked it up. Yours is better than mine. <laughs> God's got something for us, and it's extraordinary. So, consider this. What has God placed before you then? What has God placed before you to be faithful with? What is the moment then that God has set before you? Where are you spiritually? Where are you physically? Where are you emotionally? Like, like, what is it that God has placed before you? What's the opportunity that God has before you? What, What do you keep saying yes to and then no at the last minute? 
Or what do you just keep saying no to, no to, no to, no to, and God has called you to say yes to something for him? So now chapter 17, verse 5, says, But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. Seems like those guys are always around. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas. Who's Jason? He's just a Christian. He's just an ordinary guy that sometimes would say, hey, listen, if you guys need a place to stay, you can stay at my place. And some people think, well, maybe Jason had some means, maybe he had some wealth. Well, we're not really sure. It's just, this is just a guy. He's not even a deacon like Stephen and Philip. This is just a guy who's a Christian. He's a convert. And so the riot, they're looking for Paul and Silas, and they go to Jason's house. They heard he was, they were there, and, and no one's there. So what do they do? Let's, let's beat up Jason. Isn't that awesome? So they attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas, so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. This is awesome. So, and here's the complaint that was brought before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world. Some translations will say this. They turned the world upside down. And now they are here disturbing our city too. And with Jason and the members of his household, they're basically saying vis-a-vis, -vis, these are guys that, they're the cohorts. These are, these are the real troublemakers. Not the people causing the mob. These are the troublemakers. They've turned the world upside down. They're causing trouble all over the place. I happen to think that that's extraordinary. When's the last time you were called a troublemaker for the kingdom? Have you been called troublemaker for other reasons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not saying, hey, just go out and start just make disturbances for stupidity's sake. But what about living a life that's extraordinary? That makes a marked difference. That doesn't play church, but actually becomes the church. So that the world... It's just different. I was talking to someone a couple weeks ago, and they said, Pastor, you know, um, someone at my job came up to me and said, you know, when you walk in the room, we all stop cursing. And I was like, yeah, that's okay, good deal. So you're having influence. And then it was, so what do I do now with that? Well, they've already cracked the door open. You're already living some type of life that is making a difference now. Just follow it up with something else. God gives us opportunities every single day. Every single day. There are moments every single day. Close with this. I'm painting my house. And so if you shake my hands, I did the best I could. I got blue underneath my fingernails and it's freaking me out, but it's okay, so... So I'm painting my house, and I got, I'm doing three different colors, and it's just it's a hot mess, and it's, everything's paints everywhere, and I got a paint sprayer and a roller and a brush and a mop and tons and tons and tons of wet wipes because I'm spilling everywhere. And so I'm out there, and I'm, I'm painting the soffit, and I got the sprayer, and I got, I got paint everywhere, and I got... You wear your best clothes when you paint, right? So I got this clothes. I got holes in the clothes. I got... I mean, you got parts of me hanging out. It's just, I'm just, I'm a hot mess, and I'm just, I'm doing this. And a person in our community is walking their dog, and uh, they stopped, and they said, looks really nice. And I was like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's paints in my, thank you. I take it off my glasses. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, they took a step closer from the sidewalk onto my lawn. And I'm thinking, 
if they come, like it looks good from the road, looks amazing from the road. You come closer, it kind of doesn't look so good. Um, and they come real close, and the person says, can I ask you a question? I've never had a conversation with this person. I've waved. I know who they are. I've never had a conversation. Can I ask you a question? And I said, of course. It's about my dreams. So that's a very specific question about dreams. And I begin to share with them about dreams. I'm trying to discern in the conversation if there's any faith background, if there's something. And I just decided this is a good moment to jump into the deep end of the pool. And I said, can I tell you something? I said, God loves you so much. All that's been going on in your life, all the challenge, because there was a story with these dreams. I said, all this stuff. I said, it may be that the Lord is getting your attention to let you know that he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus. He died on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin so that you could have life with him and know him. So I'm thinking, the only thing they can do, they can walk away from me. They could hit me with a paint gun. I don't know. But instead, the individual began to cry. He said, this is what I needed to hear today. They're walking by, and, and I just, I'm like, okay. They're, I, they're, their phone ring, and, and they're walking away. They hung up the phone. They turned back, and they said, where's your church? Well, I didn't. I didn't know she knew that I was a Christian. I didn't know she knew I was a pastor. And I said, my church is just down the road and, you know, whatever she's, what time is service? I told her, and the individual said, you, you're probably going to see me. I got to get this phone call. Thanks for talking to me. And they kept walking. I'm just painting a house. On a day off, hot, sweaty, yucky, smelly, not planning on talking to anyone about the Lord. It wasn't even on my radar. But the Lord was talking to someone, tugging them, tugging them, tugging them. That person walked down the road. When they got down the road, I ran in the house. I just began praying for them. I grabbed my wife. I said, the most amazing thing just happened. Let's pray for this individual. I told them the person's name. And it was like the whole rest of the time I'm out painting, the Lord is simply saying, you know what? There's a whole lot of people that I just want you to take the time to just tell them about me. Now, I know this. I'm a pastor. God's helped me to lead lots of people to Jesus, but sometimes... If you catch where I'm going, sometimes I'm only thinking about painting the house. And you and I, we may be in, I'm just thinking about painting a house moments. And while we are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people that are walking by that God has been trying to get their attention. And he's waiting for an Ananias. He's waiting for a Judas. He's waiting for a Jason. He's waiting for a Stephen. He's waiting for a Philip. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Waiting for me to simply say, in our ordinary moments, God has an extraordinary purpose. And that's the truth. Can you say amen? Amen. If you're able, stand to your feet. Every head up, every eye open, everybody looking around. I'd rather do it that way. How many want to be what God's called you to be? And how many of us know that, even though we raised our hand for that, how many know we still got some issues? Okay.
God took away Saul's sin, did not take away his issues. He started to deal with lots of issues. But God used him. I just want you to know something, friends, that don't allow your issue to become an excuse for not being what God has called you to be. And the time for that, the time for that is now. It's just now. I just want to pray over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for every heart, every life that's here tonight. I thank you for those that are watching online. And Lord, our, our desire in this moment is to simply be what you've called us to be, what you've designed us to be. And Lord, for so many of the reasons and excuses that we've come up with where we have vacated our post, where we've turned the other direction, we ask, Lord, that you would redeem the time and give us fresh opportunity to be the men and women that you've called us to be. I thank you, Lord, that you're still in the business of changing the names Judas changing the name Saul, that you still straighten things out, even though they are crooked beyond belief. So Lord, because of that confession, help us, God, to be participants in the journey. An extraordinary journey. Lord, let this be our prayer that lasts. For Christ's sake we ask. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family. Love you so much. Thank God for you. Uh, hug one another while you leave, and can't wait to see you on Sunday. It's going to be an amazing day. Bring someone with you. Don't come alone.